blessings of the Triple Gem, warmest welcome to all the execs, members, and friends of the Warwick Buddha Society. Today's Dhamma session has come at the kind request of Samathi and Danone to contemplate some of the Buddha's teachings, undertake a little meditation together, and get a taste of how they can be beneficial in finding balance and even relief from studies, work, and other parts of our lives. The title for today's Dhamma session is The Power of an Unhindered Mind. And we're going to particularly focus on contemplating the five hindrances and the different kinds of instructions or medicine prescribed by the Buddha to overcome or even temporarily remove these blocks from the mind. So we can begin by paying homage to the Triple Gem, so homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dhamma, and homage to the Noble Sangha. So what we'll cover today is we'll go through some tips and reminders. And these are things that will help us to get the most out of this session. And we'll look at the question of what is meditation. And the reason we look at this is because Buddha's teachings are quite unique. And we want to see or answer the question of what makes it different from other things that are out there and how we're meant to develop the mind. Then we'll go straight into what does the Buddha say about the five hindrances? Why is it important to understand and overcome? And it's very important to hear the Buddha's words, to get a real sense for why we want to contemplate the five hindrances. And then we'll spend most of our session deep diving into each of the five hindrances, including a short meditation on each. And of course, we'll have time for questions and answers, and we'll end the session with sharing the merit and the blessing. So these tips and reminders, the first one is keep an open mind. When we hear the Buddha's teachings, sometimes there's things that we've heard before, other times it's new things, or it's connecting something that we may not have understood before. And be okay with not understanding everything. Like one of the most frustrating things about this Dhamma path is that sometimes we can't understand what the Buddha is saying. And for this reason, it's really good to be reasonably okay with not understanding everything. Maybe all we need from a session is, is what we actually understood. So little is enough at times. Remember that we're all learners. So we're helping one another as Kalyanamittas, so good friends trying to develop together. And we want to apply ourselves to the meditation. So apply ourselves to the Buddha's words and then apply ourselves to the Buddha's meditation. And we connect through using our own examples. So in order to get that direct experience or insight into the Dhamma, we need to take our own examples and follow the Buddha's instructions. So when we gain insight in our meditation, we see the Dhamma. And in seeing the Dhamma, we see the Buddha. And of course, in seeing the Buddha, we see the Dhamma again. So this is the way it works. And lastly, let's have good wishes for everyone today. We start from a place of gratitude for the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha and all the people who help and support us to walk this noble path, including those who are on this Zoom session today. So let's begin with the question of what is meditation? So you don't have to verbally answer this question, but just think about it for a few moments. So some of the answers that usually come up are sitting very still, focusing on breathing, trying to stop our thoughts is another one, concentrating our mind, uh, or another one could be developing very high mind states. And then for others, it's developing psychic powers. So as we know, there are many different ways to calm the mind, to concentrate the mind and to still our thoughts. Some don't even involve meditation. So, for example, one can be very skilled at something. So if you play sports and you're able to get the ball exactly where it needs to go or face a ball if it's cricket and be able to respond in that moment to also place the ball where you want it to go or a skill such as shooting a target accurately or even something like hand-making those tiny ships in a bottle. 
So there's a high degree of skill and concentration involved in all those things and also calmness in the mind. And there's also calming the mind and stilling thoughts through things like sex, alcohol, drugs, and things of that nature. And then, of course, there's also other forms of meditation and techniques that existed before, during, and after Gautama Buddha. So we ask the question, what makes the Buddha's teaching unique? And the Pali word is bhavana, and we translate this as meditation, but it can also be translated as cultivating the mind or mental development. So development being the key word here. So what the Buddha says about bhavana, meditation, development, is that it's about developing the Noble Eightfold Path. And he encourages us to develop this as the way leading to the cessation of all suffering. So when you refer back to the Four Noble Truths, meditation is developing the Noble Eightfold Path. When we follow the Buddha's instructions, we contemplate the truth of the way things really are. And when you feed the mind the truth, the result is right concentration. And so this is the Samma Samadhi in Pali. And what happens is we get the proper stilling of thoughts. So when you look at it, it's a wisdom or insight pathway that begins with right view. And when we look at these other methods, and mainly the other methods of meditation, these things concentrate and calm the mind, but they don't necessarily establish the right view. Rather, they're still imbued with wrong view about the world, about this whole predicament. So it's very important also to note that the Buddha encourages stopping unwholesome thoughts by cultivating wholesome thoughts. And so when the right view is established, we develop the other path factors as well. And this is how we get to the right concentration. And if we continue to develop the path, it ultimately results in right knowledge and right liberation. Now, the other answer that the Buddha would give for meditation is developing the seven factors of enlightenment, the Bojangas. And the seven factors of enlightenment arise when we also develop this Noble Eightfold Path and overcome the five hindrances, that like we're not nourishing the five hindrances. So our session today is in line with what the Buddha has taught about meditation in this way. Now, before we launch into looking at the five hindrances, let's just briefly go over the Noble Eightfold Path. So this is the path that the Buddha calls non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion. And so it very much leads with right view. So this is very important because we understand about what is kusala, so what is skillful. We know the distinction from what is unskillful, so akusala in Pali. And so there are profitable and unprofitable roots associated with those things. And we understand that there is amma and rebirth. And so there are results of our mental, verbal, and physical action. And so there's an understanding of this process of dependent arising and much, much more. So if we meditate with the wrong view, the Buddha says we don't end up with right concentration. What happens is we end up developing the wrong path and there is some kind of wrong concentration. The mind will still remain hindered by greed, hatred and delusion. And so one remains still far away from liberation. So the instructions, when we follow them, the Buddha is always correcting our view. Like most of the suttas that you read, the Buddha starts with saying, do you know what is wholesome, what is unwholesome? Do you know what uh, should be done? And so when we develop the Noble Eightfold Path, the Buddha is saying, have the right intention, have the, the right thoughts, and actively abandon really hateful, deluded thoughts. And this is the way to walk the path. So when you look at right effort, right mindfulness, what the Buddha says in the Mahachattarisaka Sutta is that they work together with right view in order to make that happen. And the same thing happens with the other path factors of right speech, right action, right livelihood. This is our, in a way, especially the right action, right speech, right livelihood. This is really our Arya Kantasila, our virtue that we develop for the purpose of developing the path. And so the fruit of doing all these things, starting with the right view, is right concentration. So we don't force ourselves to stop thoughts. It happens when we cultivate this path. And so the mind naturally becomes one-pointed, concentrated, and still. And our spiritual faculties, when we meditate in this way, 
with what the Buddha instructs, they sharpen. And so whether it's the ultimate goal of liberation or we want to develop the mind and see things as they really are, or simply being able to achieve success at exams or studies, at our work, or to be a benefit in the world, it's really important to harness the power of an unhindered mind and to remove certain blocks. So what does the Buddha say about the five hindrances? So with the Noble Eagle Path in mind, the five hindrances in Pali is called Pancha Nibbana. Pancha being five, Nibbana being hindrances that hinder the development of the mind. So the Buddha says the five hindrances are called obstructions, obstacles, coverings, entanglements in one who trains in the path. That's from the Tavija Sutta. And in the Akusalarasi Sutta, the Buddha says the five hindrances are a complete heap of unwholesome, so they're Akusala. And then in the Avija Sutta, which is all about ignorance, the Buddha says the five hindrances are the nutriment or the food for ignorance. So if the five hindrances are present, we keep nourishing ignorance. So it makes sense when the Nibbana Sutta says Five hindrances are the makers of blindness. They cause the lack of vision, lack of knowledge. They're detrimental to wisdom, tending to irritation or annoyance, and they lead away from Nibbana. This makes sense because if we're nourishing ignorance, then we're weakening wisdom. And so the Buddha also says, when one dwells with a mind obsessed by the five hindrances, that even those verses that have been recited over a very long time do not recur to the mind, let alone those that have not been recited. So that's the Sangharava Sutta. So if we're interested in improving our memory rather than weakening it, we want to uh, remove the five hindrances. And lastly, on a positive note, in the Anivarana Sutta, the Buddha says, when a noble disciple listens to the Dhamma with eager ears, attending to the Dhamma as a matter of vital concern, directing one's whole mind to it, on that occasion, the five hindrances are not present in the person. On that occasion, the seven factors of enlightenment go to fulfillment. So this particular one always uh, inspires me because I think when we listen to Dhamma, um, the five hindrances get subdued and the factors of enlightenment. Uh, have the ability to get developed and so it's a it's a really good thing so even from these selected words of the buddha we can already see why it's important and beneficial to understand contemplate and apply medicine for the five hindrances what we don't realize is that we live with the five hindrances active most if not all of the time unless we're meditating and going into um into the mental absorption for jhana so similarly if we observe our world and what's going on in the world, we see the same thing. The five hindrances are active. And what runs through all five hindrances is the idea that there is something in the world that is pleasing. We can somehow control our conditions, make them last, and there is pleasure to be gained. So it's worth pursuing and taking it as me in mind. So if we're conditioned from a very young age to follow worldly tendencies, then the hindrances end up driving our actions. So our mental actions, our verbal actions, our physical actions, and most of our choices. And if that's the case, then they're rooted in greed, hatred, and delusion. So they're driving us away from the noble eightfold path. They're driving us away from a mind that easily concentrates. So what this means is if the hindrances are present, the mind has difficulty concentrating, our memory weakens, we lack mind energy. The hindrances obstruct us in daily life, so it will affect our studies, our work, our relationships, our entertainment, and other things. And when it comes to spiritual practice, we would be obstructed from developing the mind due to unwholesome mind state. And the mind would habitually experience unhappiness, a sense of lack, a sense of dis-ease, and so we would, would find it difficult to make progress on the Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path and getting to those higher concentration levels. And due to the five hindrances corrupting the mind, they would block or weaken wisdom. And what we'll see is that we 
end up making quite unwise choices, so a lot of poor decision-making. Now, in contrast to that, when the five hindrances are absent or abandoned, even temporarily, we can expect the mind to concentrate more easily, that our memory improves, we can retain more, and we have more mind energy. And likewise, when they're absent, then we get better outcomes in daily life. So we get better outcomes in our studies, in our work, in our relationships and more. And when it comes to spiritual practice, the beauty of it is we start to be able to develop the mind and cultivate wholesome mind states and remain in wholesome mind states. And so the mind would experience more happiness, more contentment, more ease. And so we start to make progress on the Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path we realize or attain to the higher concentration levels with no trouble or difficulty, and we start to see very clearly. And so this would sharpen our spiritual faculties and grow in wisdom. And as a result of that, we make wiser choices, more prudent decisions. So this is our motivation for purifying our mind of the five hindrances and being able to develop an unhindered mind. So what are the five hindrances? So we have the hindrance of sensual desire. So this is karma chanda in Pali. This is the mental corruption of wanting to find pleasure from sensory experiences. It's synonymous with covetousness. So if you know the Patupama Sutta, then you know about abhija, coveting, and also wanting to gain. So this is lava in Pali. And we recognize it when there's so much wanting, so much longing, so much coveting. The second one is the hindrance of ill will. So this is via pada. So this is mental hate or aversion where we wish ill on another person. And we can recognize it as annoyance, resentment, irritation, intolerance, even dislike. The third one is the hindrance of dullness and drowsiness. So it's this one at the end over here. And this is a corrupt mental state characterized by when we lack energy, there's drowsiness or an inclination towards weakness in the mind or unwholesome states of mind. And we can recognize this as when we have apathy or we lack motivation and it's very difficult to arouse energy. And the fourth one is the hindrance of restlessness and worry. So it's the middle one here where um, there's mental agitation, the mind's very unsettled, and we might have very excited thoughts or very troubled thoughts. And if we're worrying, then we have guilt or remorse over things that we've done wrong or, or inability to do good things. And so we recognize that the mind is heavy, it's weighed down with thoughts. And then the last one is the hindrance of doubt. And this is called Vitikicca in Pali. This is mental uncertainty. We have hesitation in the mind. We're circling in confusion around something and we recognize it as continuously looping in our thoughts of, am I doing the right thing? Have I picked this correctly? And the thoughts are somewhat doubtful about one's choices or the path. So we're going to deep dive into each of these hindrances to better understand them and to meditate on them as well. Just some short meditations. We can take the Dhamma in and apply maybe some of the meditation. When we study the suttas, what we find is the Buddha gives many different kinds of medicine and some are stronger than others. We're going to cover a few different ones under each of these hindrances and some may resonate with you more than others and some may be much more practical. Now, one thing I have to admit is that the way that I usually overcome the five hindrances is because my meditation practice is quite strong. I naturally do sutta meditations and sutta meditations activate the Noble Eightfold Path. So, for example, meditating on the Bhattupama Sutta, meditating on the Karaniya Metta Sutta. And so when you follow the Buddha's instructions very you know, closely and carefully and you get really skilled at it, what happens is you enter into the jhanas. When you enter into the jhanas, particularly the first jhana, the five hindrances are removed. And so that's if you're skilled at meditation already and you know this and you can enter into the jhanas, that's a very quick way of, of removing five hindrances. And that, that's why developing a meditation practice is very important. Now, what we're going to look at is different ways and means and looking at them um, 
eat each one. And so this is also different ways that they can be approached. So how do we contemplate the five hindrances? I think as an overview, it's good to understand each of the five hindrances to really know what they are. Secondly, it's also to know when they're actually present in the mind and also when to know when they're absent, being able to diagnose it. Thirdly, it's also about the power of the Buddha's teachings that in order to understand how did they come to arise, if you know about the Buddha and the way he teaches, he's always saying, how does something come to arise and how does something come to pass away? And so he's always asking, what was the cause of it and what was the condition for it? And so that's when you really know and you really investigate it, it's a powerful thing. The fourth thing is really, once they've arisen, knowing what kind of medicine to apply. So Buddha prescribes many different things and certain ones may resonate with you. And so you use that kind of medicine to abandon the hindrance. You don't allow it to be there because otherwise it blocks the mind. And so you can't harness the power of the mind. And the last thing is really, once you get really good at it, then you know how to prevent it in the future. And so all of this is actually the manupasana. So contemplating the Dhamma and it's in line with what is in Mahasatipatthana and sutras like that. So one other thing to briefly highlight is that the hindrances are linked. So think of it like a process that we are unconsciously conditioned to run. So they're like habit tendencies. And it usually kicks in when we gravitate towards pleasure or we experience a decline in pleasure or happiness and we want to fix it. And so we try and fix it through things like sensual pleasures and, and it kicks off from there. Or we experience something that's stressful or painful in our day and we want to fix that. And so again, we turn to things um, that involve the five hindrances. The first thing we usually do is go towards the sensual pleasures and maybe it's something to eat or drink, listen to, uh, watch or physical touch or, or things of that nature. When that sensual experience starts to slide or decline, we go to ill will because we wanted the pleasure from that sensual experience to last. And when it doesn't last, we get irritated. From ill will, we go to dullness and drowsiness because we try to numb ourselves with other forms of distractions and try to endure or tolerate the condition. So we might go and binge watch something in front of the television or scroll through our smartphone or, or just simply fall asleep, can't, can't even stand the conditions that are there. And so the body becomes very heavy, lethargic, the mind gets weaker. And from there, we tend to make quiet and wise voices with that mind state, there's sickness in the mind. From dullness and drowsiness, also called sloth and torpor, we go to restlessness and worry because we're highly conditioned to be doing something. And so the mind always agitates and says, should I do this or do that? Is it better this way or that? And so the restlessness takes hold or we gravitate towards worrying about something that we did before. Maybe we were, were breaking our virtue and doing something that we shouldn't have done or we're worrying about not having done something that would have been good for us. As the mind gets swept away, it doesn't settle down. With restlessness and worry, we go to doubt because uncertainty arises. Are my choices the correct ones? This didn't work out, but should I still follow this path? If I keep following this path, will I gain? So the mind is in confusion and it, it weakens further. So you can see with the five hindrances, the way they link, they keep weakening the mind. And we can go back to sensual pleasures again, always to think that we can fix it. So what is missing when the five hindrances are active is really the truth about our predicament. And we're going to look at this further. So we'll start to deep dive into each one of the hindrances. So let's start with the hindrance of sensual desire, so karma chanda in Pali. As we highlighted before, this is a mental corruption. We want to find pleasure from sensory experiences, so through our eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body. And as we said, it's synonymous with covetousness and wanting to gain. So sensual desire, it's conditioned by ignorance and craving. You've probably heard that before. And what you may not have heard or, or hasn't been emphasized before is that sensual desire is the primary reason why we're born into this kind of body. We needed this kind of body or we wanted this kind of body 
in, to, in order to experience sensual pleasures in the world. And it means we want to be with our families or groups. We want to enjoy material wealth. We want to enjoy all kinds of sensory experiences. Now, what's unfortunate is that we didn't realize or understand that when we are born, we birth, we're all subject to old age, sickness, and death. These vessels that we call our bodies are death bound. And therefore, we experience pain, sadness, sorrow, lamentation, despair, separation from what is pleasing, union with what is displeasing, not getting what we want. So this, this is the whole mass of suffering. What we really want, if all things were not the way they are like this, is we want to enjoy all sensual pleasures without any downside. But that's not the case. So this bigger picture is important to understand and contemplate. We don't often hear people talking about it, even though it's a big part of the Buddha's teachings, it's the first noble truth of suffering. If we spend our entire life imbued in sensual desire, what can we expect at the end of our life, at the point of death? So this is really a question that provides the context for why the Buddha says, there is danger in sensual pleasures, danger in having a mind hindered or imbued with sensual desire, having so much wanting, longing, coveting, craving. If you investigate the world, the world conditions us all in sensual desire. Think about what the world, through our parents, teachers, role models, coaches, family and friends, news media, entertainment, celebrities, books, and so on, what do they all encourage us towards? They encourage us towards living with, with greed. That it's okay to want. Greed is good. Want more. Coveting is fine. And so when we're encouraged in this way, we're encouraged to have goals like if I get this degree or if I get two degrees, three degrees, if I get my master's, if I get my PhD, I'll have made it. If I get this job at this super duper company earning this much, and if I fast track towards management or leadership, then I'll be happy. If I start up my own business or take over the family business, then my friends and family and peers will approve of me. If I work hard, establish myself, gain material wealth with all the trimmings, people will respect me. If I become famous, popular, then I'll have made it. If I have this amount of money, these assets, this kind of life, then I'm sorted. So this is not saying don't study, no, don't find a good job, don't, don't go towards wealth and invest in good relations and all of that. That's not what I'm saying. We need to do certain things in order to live in the world, to live a wholesome life. But it's important to con consider the bigger context, like to investigate what is the mind like when it is weighed down with sensual desire and wanting? Is the mind happy? Is it content? And it's also good to ask, how much is enough? Like when you start on the roller coaster of greed, even wealthy people, celebrities, royalty, powerful people, they'll tell you, they'll demonstrate, it's never enough. When you look at people who are driven by sensual desire, what you see is that despite temporary happiness, like that fleeting moment of, of happiness, the result is always sadness. And then pain, maybe even depression. When pleasure diminishes or ends, there is what the Buddha calls painfulness and change. Vipranama dukkha in Pali. We don't often think in these terms, but even as we age, we can't enjoy sensual pleasures as before because our taste buds age, our eyesight worsens, we experience hearing loss and more. So if you're at a young age, these are not things that are being considered. And without any other options, if we don't hear this truth from the Buddha, then we keep going back to sense pleasures, trying to fix painful feelings, trying to lift ourselves. So when we experience temporary pleasure, we want to have it again. When certain sensory experiences no longer work, what you find, and we read this in the news, and maybe we have examples in our family or with our friends, people try the harder stuff, the more addictive thing. So you see addiction to alcohol, addiction to drugs, addiction to porn, 
plastic surgery, gambling, taking risky investments, criminal activity, violence, more. So when it comes to the hindrance of sensual desire, it's good to see how we constantly turn to or gravitate towards sensual things whenever we find it difficult to bear with the current conditions. When we experience that decline in pleasure, in the Ahara Sutta, the Buddha says, sensual desire arises or increase, increases when we frequently give unwise attention or we unwisely contemplate to the sign of pleasing or attractive. This is Subha, Subha Nivita. So having made contact with the eye, ear, nose, tongue and body of an object, we find it pleasing or attractive. So this is Subha. We think we can make it last. This is Nietzsche. And therefore, we expect to experience the happiness or the pleasure, the sukha. This becomes our solution to overcome stress, to overcome sadness or discontent, or to get more pleasure. Without the Buddha's teachings, most of us are highly conditioned to be pleasure seekers. Now, some people don't like this statement because... They, they just never have heard it before. They don't like to be called that label. But when you look at the kind of body we've birthed, so what we were saying in the beginning, we have we have birthed a body that has eyes in order to see forms. We have birthed a body that has ears in order to hear sound, tongue in order to taste flavors, nose in order to smell odors, body in order to experience physical sensations or touch. Now, if we're really honest, and I include myself in this, we all have a very low tolerance for feeling low, experiencing stress, sadness, all those sorts of things. And so what happens is we get addicted to peak moments. We try to reconstruct them over and over. So it might be looking forward to the next party, the concert, the outing to the pub, the shopping trip to get the latest thing, getting more followers or likes on social media, acing a test or beating someone you don't like in your class, getting the top marks on an assignment, taking holidays abroad, winning at a game or a sport, experiencing a good date, visiting home after an extended time away, receiving a home-cooked meal, getting the job or the promotion, simply being able to Netflix and chill. So those are some examples, but we try and replicate it over and over again as the pleasure subsides or when we're feeling low. The problem is, if we don't understand the nature of sensual pleasures, then we continue through life highly dependent and bound to sensual pleasures for our happiness. Our mind can become obsessed and even addicted, so we cling to peak moments at whatever the price. So we become driven by our senses. Now, it's important to realise that sensual pleasures are temporary in nature. The pleasure we de derive from them, as we said before, is fleeting. We experience them and then it ends. When they end, we feel sadness. So think of the feeling at the end of the party or a concert or something you've enjoyed. When you have to say goodbye to loved ones after a good visit. When you're making your way home after a holiday. The day after your birthday. Or when a new model of a gadget is released. Just a few weeks after you've purchased a new, a new, that new gadget. Or when you break up with someone you thought was the one. So because we take these things as pleasing and we receive some pleasure from them, we try to replicate them over and over. And so there's a price to be paid. The Buddha uses this simile in the Maha Asapura Sutta. He says that sensual desire is like a debt. We become indebted to things we take as pleasurable. And it can be viewed as a debt in our mind or a debt that we're bound to greed. Or in a literal sense, having to fund our sensual pleasures by working or someone else like our parents might have to work. And when it isn't enough, we take out loans and there's interest to be paid and the whole painful process of being chased if we don't pay enough the loans. Now, if you look at the state of the world, it's literally in a massive amount of debt. And this is due to living with greed. Uh, we're encouraged to indulge. We're endorsed to live in this way and prosper. But we can already see how fragile our, our world is, our ecosystem is, by living this way. 
how indebted countries are, how inequitable the distribution of wealth, how unhappy people have become, how heavy the mind state. And so it's difficult to live easily with each other in the world. And what we forget is with sensual pleasures, particularly wealth, these can be taken away from us. The Buddha says in the Volga Sutta that they can be taken away by fire, water, kings, which is the equivalent of government, uh, thieves, and also displeasing heirs. And we'll eventually be separated from our loved ones. So our family, friends, teachers, pets, colleagues, helpers. And this is because of old age, sickness, and death. And so we start to see that there's danger in sensual desire, that we recognize we don't want to be foolish that these temporary pleasures end up in sadness and the pleasure de declines. So this does not mean that we throw away our studies. It doesn't mean we don't go for jobs. It doesn't mean we don't have good relationships and all that. It's not that we're meant to consider them pointless. It's that with the right view in our mind, we choose more wisely. We make decisions very carefully. And we're not just simply driven by our senses and driven by the narrative that the world is telling us because we see the danger. So if we realize this Dhamma, then we have wisdom, clarity, and understanding. So we can be more mindful of sensual desires. We can go through life more mindful about making wiser choices. And so the right view is leading us. And so we can be better people in the world. When we don't use sensual pleasures as our crutch, then the Buddha likens it to being free of debt. So we can literally be free of debt, or we can manage less debt, or we can harness the power of the unhindered mind. So this is very helpful to remember. So some of the things that the Buddha says as medicine for sensual desire is encouraging sense restraint. So guarding the doors to the sense faculties. Now, if we realize the truth of what the Buddha says, sense restraint becomes our friend. It's skillful means something associated with happiness. It gives us boundaries. But if we don't understand the benefit of sense, sense restraint, then we see it as taking away our pleasures. So we won't see the benefit. Now, we know that the Buddha encourages monastics, particularly to develop sense restraint, but it can also be beneficial to lay people. Because when we actively restrain the sense senses, particularly at important times. So if we need to study or complete assignments or it's leading up to exams, sense restraint can be very useful because concentration is needed to get through those periods, these important events. So when you see the benefit in those areas, say you have sense restraint leading up to exams, then you might choose to expand it to other areas of life at different times. So for example, we might take care using social media like not scrolling through the feed of influencers or celebrities because we don't want to get enticed towards products they're promoting. Or we're vigilant when we go through the shopping mall, taking care to purchase only what is needed rather than be sucked in to, to buy things that are not necessary. Or we may take take solitude you know, during periods where we really need to have more energy, more mind energy, and so we might refrain for a period of time from socializing or partying in order to keep the mind somewhat safe. So what is also associated with sense restraint is contentment, like being happy to give up sensual pleasures for a period of time or even just to develop a noble path. So this is associated with even letting go, being able to renunciate at time. There's also generosity. It's helpful to go against wanting by being generous. So instead of reinforcing me and mine, we give, we share with others. So it can be sharing material things or it can be sharing space. It can be sharing our knowledge. So we share our lecture notes, we share our explanations, we share past papers. And so the mind naturally brightens when we're willing to, to do these things. And all these things are qualities that help us to develop loving kindness, metta, and they're all linked with the non-greed path. One of the other things is to associate with the right company, associating with good friends. When we're around friends who are content, generous and virtuous, it's easier for us. In contrast, if we're around friends who are always wanting to be with sensual pleasures and 
uh, not keeping the mind safe, then mental stains into the, our mind. So there might be envy, stinginess, hypocrisy, rivalry, things like that. So when you look at that, you realize there are certain things that we can do. The strongest medicine that the Buddha gives to overcome sensual desire is frequently giving wise attention to the sign of displeasing or repulsive. So this is Asubha Nimika in Pali. And this, we activate this if we want to overcome sensual desire. It's useful to know. It may not be for everybody, but an example could be if you're longing for a particular kind of food, maybe you're longing, you study abroad and you're longing for your mother's home cooking and you contemplate that food and because it's troubling you, you contemplate that plate of food if it was left out for 10 days, would you still have the same thoughts about it? So that's a useful contemplation, at least to settle the mind down, particularly if there's lots of craving for, for mom's cooking or something or some other kind of food. You give the mind some truth. Likewise, you could apply that to people. So if we are infatuated, troubled by people, we can think about the body comprising of 32 body parts. So this is really a way of unlumping the whole because it's the whole that we take as pleasing or we can contemplate the elements or we can recall the impurities in the body. Now, if we're really infatuated with somebody and we can't get them out of our mind, the mind is blocked, but we need to study, we can't focus, then what we realize is we usually focus on the good bits of a person, like how attractive they are and, and all the things, like their hair, their shape, their, their color, whatever, whatever. But if you think about, and this is going to sound a little ridiculous, but if you think about someone farting, or if you think about the fact that they are also like us, they also need to go to the toilet and do a dump, then these are normal bodily functions, but they're also the truth. Sensual desire has a way of diminishing when we contemplate something like that about a person. And like I see it in a tropical country that once you buy a new thing, things deteriorate very quickly in this country. And so you actually see something quite displeasing about objects. Like even if you paint a house over here, in a very short time, it starts to deteriorate because of the climate. So you really start to see the sign of displeasing. So what you really see with the Buddhist medicine is that there's no horrible side effects. So there's no such things as hangovers, heaviness in the mind, regrets. When we contemplate in this way or we activate some of the more practical things that the Buddha advises or encourages, then the mind actually feels a lot calmer, a lot happier. And if we heed the Buddha's words and really apply this medicine, then we get to abandon sensual desire. So we're developing the non-greed path to abandon the greed path. So to contemplate or meditate on sensual desire, what we need to do is take our own example. We need to contemplate how did sensual pleasure arise? How did this sensual desire arise? And when we see that, we need to also acknowledge that sensual desire hinders the mind. Now, usually we take something as pleasing or attractive when we contact form, and so that's how it arises in the mind. So an example could be we see someone wearing something attractive on campus and sensual desire arises, thinking, oh, I want to go and buy that outfit. I wonder where they got it from. Or friends are talking about upcoming holidays and you weren't thinking of going abroad. But then when they're talking about it, sensual desire arises because you think, oh, I'd like to do that. And maybe you feel this impulse to go book a holiday or, or talk to a friend about it. Another example is scroll scrolling through social media and you see that someone's eating at the latest trendy place and they're raving about it and sensual desire arises to go check out that place or or something like that, that it's not even on your, your radar. Or you see someone's girlfriend or boyfriend and you think, oh, they're really cute and it starts to trouble the mind. So it's important to see that sensual desire hinders the mind. So as we meditate on it, you take your own example and really look at it. The mind is imbued with wanting, longing, that sort of thing, sensual thinking. And so what we need to do is really see, okay, what medicine can we apply? So we don't do all of it. Usually something in this list resonates with, with the example that 
that you've taken. And if it's contemplating the simile of debt, sometimes that's really helpful. We become indebted to central desires or you see that it drives uh, behaviors and choices. And when you give up central desire, it's like being free of debt, freedom from being led by our senses. And if you contemplate sense restraint and contentment, really being able to let go, being able to be generous, that's also very helpful. And then, of course, what we're saying about the strongest medicine. So if it's food, you know, seeing the sign of displeasing to the person, the same kind of thing, being able to recall the impurities in the body or the elements. So you can see it really starts to calm the mind down. So when we meditate on it, what you notice once you apply the medicine is to notice the absence of sensual desire. You've removed it. And so you allow the mind to gladden, to see that there is space in the mind. The mind's not so heavy now. And so that's when the mind starts to concentrate. So what I'd like to do is do a short meditation. Um, so let's look at abandoning sensual desire. I think maybe if I stick to the other slide, it might be useful because you might want to recall the steps. So really, we just take out an example, just one simple example where we've had sensual desire in the mind. Maybe something came into your mind today and you see that it blocks the mind because the mind is swirling about it. Then you look at what kind of medicine can you apply to it. So it could be the sign of displeasing, which is the strongest medicine, or it could be contemplating that it's a debt in the mind and that we're led by our senses or one of the other ones. And then if you're able to abandon sensual desire in the meditation right now, then you look at what the mind is like without sensual desire. And you can be happy about that, that the mind has now got the ability to be unblocked and has the ability to concentrate. So let's do this meditation for a few minutes. Um, take your own example, apply the medicine, and then let the mind be happy. Okay, I'll call us out when we can finish meditation. Okay, blessings of the triple gem.
Okay, we can come out of the meditation. It gives you an idea about contemplating sensual desire. So we can now look at the hindrance of ill will. So as we highlighted before, this is mental hate or aversion, where we wish ill on another person. So we recognize this as annoyance, resentment, irritation, intolerance. We take offense, we feel insulted or slighted, and even dislike arises in the mind. So examples of ill will, when it arises, it could be we think someone stole our parking spot when we were parking, or a lecturer tells our group to be quiet. So it can arise when a friend cancels a meetup last minute or when we're not invited to an event, it will may arise. Or when some kind of pleasure from an activity declines, so the end of a meal, end of a party, end of a holiday. Or we hear someone insults our loved one. Or we think our partner is too attentive to someone we dislike. So when ill will invades our mind, it's like our thoughts keep heating up and something or someone is affecting the mind. In the Agatha Vatu Sutta, the Buddha says there are nine grounds for ill will or resentment. So the first three are someone has harmed me or hurt me in the past, in the future, they're doing it now, or they'll do it in the future. The second lot of three is someone has harmed the people I love in the past. They're doing it now, or they'll do that in the future. And the last set of three is a person is helping someone I dislike right now in the past, or they're going to do it in the future. So it's very useful when ill will arises to really look at that. Like This is where we assign permanency to what has happened to it. We're holding on to it. And so we might even exaggerate some of the situations simply to perpetuate ill will in the mind. Now, the simile that the Buddha uses in the Mahasura Sutta for ill will is the Buddha says a person is afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill, and they have no appetite, and their body is weakened. So the simile is really of a sick person. What the Buddha is highlighting is that when we allow ill will to linger in the mind, we remain in this state, like the sick state. And so it's a huge obstruction in the mind. So if we refer to the Ahara Sutta, the Buddha says, ill will arises or increases when we frequently give unwise attention to the signs of anger or aversion. So in Pali, this is patiga emitter. Now, if you notice when there's ill will, we keep circling around that sign of anger or aversion and our perceptions and stories associated with that. By doing this, we continue to feel, to fuel ill will thoughts. And so they escalate. So in our mind, we think, oh, I hope something bad happens to that person that they did to us. And we might think, oh, I wish the person who hurt me, they're not here today. Or I don't even want to see that person, let alone hear their name. So it's similar to sensual desire thinking. It's good to see the unwholesome side of it, to see that this is unskillful, these kinds of thoughts. They're rooted in the hate part. And so it weighs down the mind. So... The Buddha says if we abandon ill will using that same simile of a sick person, it's like recovering from illness. We regain our strength and our appetite. Now, when it comes to overcoming ill will, there's other things that we can also use as medicine. Forgiveness is a very powerful medicine. Often when we've done something wrong, we wish others would forgive us very quickly. So it's good to turn that around and do that for others. It's not an easy thing to do but it's good to actually start to train in it. It's also good to remember that we don't always have all the information. Maybe the person had a bad day. Maybe they received bad news. Maybe their actions weren't intentional or purposely directed at us for the person who we have ill will towards. And the Buddha and the Noble Arahants, they often encourage us to contemplate, would we like this quality in somebody else? So if we don't like seeing ill will in other people, so we need to recognize that maybe it's not good for us to have this quality. Others wouldn't like it in us. So that's another type of medicine one can use. We can also contemplate karma, that we're the heirs of our karma and look at the result of unskillful mental action, so the vipaka karma. What the Buddha says in the Chula Karma Vibhanga Sutta is that when we're angry or bad-tempered, the worst case scenario 
is that at the breakup of the body, after death, one is reborn in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination. So that's the worst case scenario. And if we're reborn as a human, then we're born with ugliness. So that's also not good. Now, the strongest medicine that the Buddha gives for ill will is frequently giving wise attention to liberation of mind through loving kindness. So metta, chento, bimuti. When it comes to correctly cultivating metta, so loving kindness, we need to follow the instructions in the Karuniya Metta Sutta. So this is in Sutta Nipata. We can't go through the whole teaching of that now, but the essence of developing true metta in accordance with that teaching is understanding the first noble truth of suffering and cultivating the 10 skilled states. So our physical actions, our verbal actions and our mental actions need to be wholesome. So in simple terms, like if, if we were to do metta, just in very simple terms, correctly, if we see all living beings, as brothers and sisters in this predicament of birth, old age, sickness and death, no matter what our circumstances are in life, we're all in the same boat. So why bear ill will? If we purify our physical conduct, our verbal conduct and our mental conduct, then we develop loving kindness to all our brothers and sisters in birth, old age, sickness and death and this whole mass of suffering. So all these things help us to develop the non hate part by abandoning the hate path. So we can do another short meditation to contemplate or meditate on ill will. So again, we take another example. So just like we said before, we, we keep associating with the sign of anger or aversion. So the example could be someone stole our parking spot or they tailgated us or horned us on the road. We develop ill will. Or someone insulted our parents or our friends or someone cancelled meeting up last minute, or maybe our girlfriend or boyfriend ignores us. That's also how ill will arises. So it's important to see that the mind is hindered, that it gets obstructed when ill will is in the mind. So we can also think about maybe we are saying this person is harming me, and maybe they'll do that in the future, whatever comes to arise. And so we need to see that we want to overcome the ill will. So we look at what is the medicine that we can apply? So we can look at the simile of a sick person, that when ill will is in the mind, then we're in this weakened state. But if we give up ill will, it's like recovering from illness. We could also practice some forgiveness. We could look at, would I like this in others? or would And therefore, would others like this in me? So that's also a way of abandoning ill will, looking at the karmic results of ill will, developing love and kindness. So you don't have to do all of them. Take your example and pick one of these medicines that resonates with you, that you think, oh, this, this will work for me. And when you meditate on it, even in this short meditation, if you abandon the ill will, see what the mind is like without ill will. Let the mind get happy and let the mind concentrate even that little bit. Okay, so let's do another little meditation and then I'll bring us out again. Blessings of the Triple Gem.
Okay, we can come out of the meditation. We can now look at the hindrance of dullness and drowsiness, so dinamitta in Pali, and this is also known as sloth and torpor. So as we said before, it's a corrupt mental state, and it's characterized by lack of energy, lethargy, and an inclination towards weak or unwholesome state. So we find it very difficult to motivate ourselves, very difficult to arouse energy, and it affects both the mind and the body. So some examples could be zoning out during a lecture, uh, mindlessly watching TV or streaming something over the internet, uh, drowsiness while we're studying, inclining towards indulgence or overindulgence in food, alcohol or drugs, uh, vegging out on the couch and feeling very disinclined towards doing anything and even nodding off while trying to meditate. So we habitually enter into this dull and drowsy state when we can't tolerate the condition. So the Buddha gives this simile in the Maha Asapura Sutta saying it's when a person is imprisoned in a prison house and this is for this dullness and drowsiness. And we don't often see drowsiness in, in this kind of way. But most of the time, we unconsciously lean into this state without seeing how harmful it is. So what the Buddha is highlighting using that simile of being imprisoned is how we become imprisoned in an unskilled state, that there's weakness in the mind. And we're essentially locking ourselves away from wholesome or beneficial state. So you can see when you try and study, if, if you keep nodding off or you want to go numb the pain, it's kind of like there's nothing wholesome about it. So even if you try to study, it doesn't go in. So it's a huge obstruction to the mind. So in other words, more, more often than not, we'd rather nap than make effort. So the mind is weak and the body is tired. The Buddha says in the Ahara Sutta that when there's this drowsiness, it arises or it increases when we frequently give unwise attention to discontent or negativity, when we give attention to uh, feeling slothful or indifferent, at a bodily level when we have unwise attention towards fidgeting or yawning, and also when we have this post-meal drowsiness. So usually we've overindulged or intoxicated and we want to take a nap, all the energy is being zapped. And then also mental sluggishness. So the mind can't energize. It's literally being rendered immobile. So when it comes to drowsiness in the mind and this paralysis that the mind has, our perceptions become distorted because we can't perceive clearly. So clearly the mind is weak, dull, and delusion is taking hold. We don't realize that often we make decisions from this kind of mind state. So they're unwise decisions. And so we become imprisoned with a deluded mind. Now, the Buddha says, if we abandon dullness and drowsiness, it's like being released from prison. So there's safety, security, we don't lose our property, and we can be happy about that. So there's a certain number of things that we can do that are quite practical. So when it comes to post-meal drowsiness, well, it makes sense. Eat in moderation. Eat with gratitude rather than greed. So it's a good habit also after eating, not to give in to drowsiness straight away. Instead, go for a walk or purposely do something that involves activity. And then only after a period of time, if the drowsiness is still there, then you take a little nap. But even when you take a little nap, it's not to overindulge. The other thing about dullness and drowsiness is to balance one's schedule. Like don't pack it all in if you can help it. Make sure you eat well, sleep well, uh, do things to brighten the mind, like exercise, meditation, and prioritize things in the day and remove unnecessary activities. In that way, dullness and drowsiness doesn't tend to overwhelm us. Changing postures can also be quite helpful. So moving between sitting, standing, walking, even lying down and also spending time outdoors. Now, the Buddha also has a lot of helpful instructions in the Pachalayamana Sutta, but the one that I want to focus on is around attending to the perception of light, because this is a very important one. Um, 
this one is actually really often used because when the mind is dull and drowsy, it often feels like it's covered by something. And so when you meditate on the perception of light, brightness comes to the mind. And so this can be very helpful, particularly when you need to do something important. The Buddha says, focus on the perception of day, thus. So as by day, so at night, as at night, so by day, regardless of whether it's night or day. Thus, with a mind that is open and uncovered, one develops a mind imbued with luminosity. So what we do is we perceive light. So we take the perception of daylight into the mind and we meditate on it. If you do it correctly, the mind immediately brightens and there's a wakefulness that arises. The other medicine that is also quite important is the Buddha encourages us to energize or make effort. So to denourish dullness and drowsiness, the Buddha says we give wise attention to the element of arousal. So that means we arouse energy, we show initiative. The second one is the element of endeavor. So we apply strength. We persist, we endure with the task to overcome dullness and drowsiness. And the last one is the element of exertion, that we exert our effort, we demonstrate courage to get out of the corrupt mind state. So those are the things that the Buddha says. So let's do another short meditation. Um, what I suggest is to just to take an example of your own. It could be something to do with zoning out during lecture or mindlessly watching TV or, or overindulging in food, drink or, or alcohol, something of that nature, and then wanting to come out of it or trying to study and feeling sleepy. What I recommend and I put all these different medicine that we just went through. But what I recommend is for this meditation, try the perception of light, just as an example. So take something, like even if you feel a little bit sleepy now, take the perception of daylight into your mind and just give it a go. And then if you have any questions about it during question time, we can go over it. So just try it out. And just allow the perception of daylight to increase or at least try and hold on to it in the mind while you meditate and see whether wakefulness emerges in the mind. Okay, let's do this just for a few minutes. Blessings of a triple champ.
Okay, we can come out of the meditation. So we now come to the hindrance of restlessness and worry. So Udacca Kukucha. And we said that this is mental agitation or having an unsettled mind. So restlessness is when the mind is imbued with troubled thoughts or excited thoughts. And worry is characterized by guilt or remorseful thoughts over wrongdoings or an inability to do good. So with restlessness, we could be stressing over whether we picked the right course electives and thinking maybe you should have gone with something else. Maybe before a party, getting into a bit of a tizzy over what kind of outfit is better to wear, this one or that one. Or we're troubled about a job offer that we want to accept. One pays more money, but the other one has a better team and more interesting work. Or maybe after an exam, we're mulling over whether the answer was good or if we should have given a different one and then when it comes to worry it could be worrying over we should have taken money we found on the cafeteria floor instead of handing it in or feeling bad about missing out on an event because we had to take time off from work so whatever the example is the mind is agitated unable to settle and so in this state we often think oh i can't stop thinking so in the Maha Asapura Sutta, the Buddha says, the simile is of a slave who is dependent on others, unable to go wherever they want. That's restlessness and worry. And so we don't often see restlessness and worry in this way. We get caught up in the unsettled mind and we're torn between whether to do this or that and we're worrying about the things that we have or haven't done. What the Buddha is highlighting about becoming enslaved is really we're enslaved by our dealings in the world, the things that we give value to, such as sensual pleasures. The mind is shackled to measuring, analyzing, trying to gain the best outcome and trying to mitigate displeasure. What we don't know or we've forgotten is the bigger picture. What we were saying before about the first noble truth, with birth, there is old age, sickness and death. So all these things that we're agitated about they don't seem so important when we remember this first noble truth. In the Ahara Sutta, the Buddha says, restlessness and worry arises or increases when we frequently give unwise attention to an agitated or unsettled mind. So it's like the mind keeps spinning with constant thoughts, is it this or that, or it worries. Now, if we give up restlessness and worry, the Buddha says, it's like being released from slavery. We become independent of others and we can go wherever we want. So there's two main things that uh, are given. The first one is for restlessness as medicine. The Buddha recommends making the determination for true. When we give the mind true, it's possible to settle the mind down. So the first noble truth of suffering is what's linked to this determination for true. That if we contemplate there's birth, with birth, it comes aging, sickness, and death, and it leads to the whole mass of suffering. We're actually establishing right view. So in the greater scheme of things, all the things that we desire in the world, we remember they're temporary. They don't last. They're subject to change and therefore suffering. And it's not worth taking as me and mine. So in this long journey of samsara, we've been transmigrating birth and death, birth and death. And there's no discoverable beginning. That's what Buddha says. So these restless thoughts in the great scheme of our journey in samsara are quite insignificant. And so if they're agitating our mind, it's because it's associating with things that are death-bound. So what we're doing in making this determination for truth is to put some context around the restless thoughts so we're not swept away with worldly conditions and outcomes. In our meditation, we might think, or we might come to realize what we've done is good enough. We can deal with whatever unfolds. Uh, maybe there's no need to perpetuate all these different kinds of restless thoughts. So it's only when we contemplate truth is it possible to start to put down some of those restless thoughts. Maybe it simply evaporates them when we contemplate on the truth. Or maybe we take a really firm decision applying wisdom. So what's important here is to activate the right view. In this way, we denourish the restlessness and the mind starts to calm or settle. When it comes to worry, 
one of the things that's really good is always to develop virtue and to activate a very healthy sense of moral shame and fear of wrongdoing because being virtuous means we have less worry to worry about. And then when it comes to shame and fear of wrongdoing, the Buddha calls them the protector. So they ensure that we stay on the straight and narrow. Now, if we have misconduct that we worry over, the Buddha says, it's good to admit it, to confess it, to disclose the transgression to a teacher or wise spiritual comp companion. We make amends in accordance with the Dhamma. This is from the Kusambhya Sutta. And we practice restraint in the future. Another way is to regret one's actions and ask forgiveness of Buddha Dhamma Sangha three times. And we make a firm intention not to do it again. So we would say by body, speech and mind, due to negligence, if I've done wrongdoing, we ask the Buddha for forgiveness. We do that again and we ask the Dhamma for forgiveness. And thirdly, we ask in the same way the Sangha. And so in this way, it's a way of cleaning the slate. Like what worry doesn't have to trouble us anymore because the mind has let go in the right way in accordance with Dhamma. So if we were to meditate on this, and I'm not sure how we're going with time, does someone want to just let me know whether we have time to do this meditation or to keep going? Yeah, I think Yeah, I think we can go ahead with the meditation. Okay, let's do the meditation then. So we take our own example and we contemplate how did restlessness and worry arise? So it's normally we give attention to those those thoughts. And so the examples we could use, and you pick your own, it could be stressing over an exam, whether your answer was good or whether you should have given another one, or we're troubled over a job offer, whether to accept this one or that one, worrying about maybe we've deceived our parents about something, or we're troubled over an argument and we actually use harsh language. So the first two are like restlessness and the last two are like worry. So if your example that you've picked is about restlessness, then you know you need to apply the medicine that is associated with bringing truth into, into the mind. So you make the determination for truth. And what happens is restlessness should subside. And when it comes to worry, we actually look at the transgression. If we've done something wrong, like harsh speech or told someone off or we've taken something that hasn't been given, we admit it. We make amends in accordance with the Dhamma. So in the meditation, you might just want to ask forgiveness of Buddha Dhamma Sangha three times. So the other way is also to contemplate the simile of being enslaved. But if you have a specific example, try applying those medicines. Okay, let's do this meditation for another few minutes and I'll call us out. When you've abandoned restlessness or worry from the mind, Allow the mind to get happy. Allow to see that it's it's free of the burden of those doors. Okay, let's meditate. Blessings of the Triple Gem.
Okay, we can come out of the meditation. So we come to the final one, which is the hindrance of doubt. And so as we highlighted before, it's mental uncertainty or hesitation. The mind is weakening because it's in confusion. And so the thoughts are always saying, am I doing the right thing? What if I pick wrong? And so it keeps looping around that. So some examples are, am I studying, studying the right degree? Is this the right university for me that will get me those opportunities? Am I associating with the right kind of people and groups? Uh, should I stay in this country after I finish my studies? Or something along the lines of, should I take a gap year to travel before looking for a job? Am I doing the right thing by investing in crypto? Is my paleo diet actually good for my health? Do I need to take vitamin supplements? So those are some examples, some are a bit ridiculous, but when the mind is imbued with doubt, it can actually be quite debilitating. So the Buddha gives the simile in the Mahasura Sutta saying that doubt is when a person with wealth and property is traveling across the desert to get to the other side. So what the Buddha is highlighting with this simile is when we try to cross the desert, there is uncertainty and confusion that can arise because we're trying to get to the other side, but we might doubt the directions that we've been given or we're worried about someone attacking while we're traveling and we're doubtful about whether we'll get a, actually manage to get to the other side. So if we allow doubt to linger in the mind, we struggle with trying to find the right path. It's a huge obstruction. So it's also linked to dullness and drowsiness because the mind is not really seeing clearly, it's spinning out in confusion and uncertainty. The really interesting thing about doubt is that because what we actually want to gain is always pleasure or some sort of gain, then the mind is also imbued with stinginess. So there's five kinds of stinginess. Stinginess due to gain, stinginess due to dwelling, stinginess due to families or groups, stinginess due to reputation, and stinginess due to dhamma or knowledge, ideas. So to explain that, like stinginess due to gain, an example of how that affects doubt is when we think, have we picked the right degree or university that will get us the good job after we complete our studies? So we want to gain the good job. Stinginess due to dwelling would be, will the profession or trade that we're training in get us the house and the material things that we want? Will it be enough? And stinginess due to families or groups, there's so many different examples, but maybe one is, will my parents still accept me if I marry this person of a different race or religion? Stinginess due to reputation could be, if I volunteer at that charity, will it add to my good reputation? And stinginess due to dumb more knowledge could be, will I be able to defend my PhD thesis or something like that? So when there is doubt in the mind, it's good to check through the five different kinds of stinginess because if there's stinginess, then we have disparaging and divisiveness. We've assigned some kind of value in accordance with our preferences, our biases, and this is what is conditioning this stinginess. So doubt arises when we're uncertain about our course of action and the outcome, whether we'll gain something and whether it will turn out as we wish. So the Buddha says in the Ahara Sutra that doubt arises or increases when we frequently give unwise attention to things that are the basis or cause for doubt. Well, that makes sense. In truth, we spend a lot of time doubting our ability to control worldly conditions, controlling and getting the right outcomes. A really good example is like that makes us really look at the truth is we all expected 2019 to be a relatively normal year. But then COVID happened and many things unfolded that we didn't expect. Most was out of our control. So if you were studying, you didn't know if you would complete your studies that year or graduate. Graduates didn't know whether they'd get jobs. And people all over the world faced innumerable challenges, like economic challenges, emotional challenges, physical challenges, all that sort of thing. But amidst all of that was the truth that we are of the nature to sicken. And if you didn't understand that, if you didn't really take that as like a, a real dhamma, then you were experiencing a lot of pain, a lot of unhappiness, a lot of uncertainty and doubt. 
but there's something very humbling if you understood this body is of the nature to thicken and there's some honesty about it no matter what the causes of COVID but it's good it's a good reminder like bringing us back to the first noble truth of suffering which we've spoken a lot during this session and that's because there's something very very powerful that when we understand birth, that there's aging, sickness, and death, it's not a morbid thing. It's coming from proper understanding. And so when we understand that this leads to the whole mass of suffering, it keeps us honest. It keeps us honest with our desires. It keeps us honest with our uh, hateful thoughts. It keeps us honest against delusion. So usually what happens when we try to control things is we try and control them out of money and power and influence, maybe our ideas, our effort. But deep down, if we really understand the first of all truth, there's so much that is not in our control. We can't stop aging, we can't stop sickness, we can't stop death. So all these other things are beyond our control as well. We might have some relative control. But, you know, out of conceit, we like to think that we have some semblance of control, maybe more than we actually have. And so the truth is that we don't. So the things that we cling to, they're unlasting, subject to change, therefore suffering. When we contemplate the Buddha simile of, of traveling across the, the desert, if we can abandon doubt simply by even reflecting on the truth, it's like crossing over to the other side. We're safe, we're secure, we haven't lost anything. And so we'd be happy about that. This particular thing is actually really profound because the true safety that the Buddha talks about is really Nibbana, when we're no longer subject to birth, old age, sickness and death and the whole mess of suffering. So in terms of overcoming or denourishing doubt, the Buddha actually says also in the Ahara Sutras, we give wise attention frequently to wholesome and unwholesome states, blameable and blameless states, inferior and superior states, dark and bright states with their counterparts. So this is really encouraging us to brighten the mind through virtuous conduct, establishing right view, knowing what should be cultivated and what should not be cultivated. So wholesome states, blameless states, superior states, bright states, they allow the mind to be relatively safe, free of doubt. And this includes developing the Noble Eightfold Path, and in contrast, unwholesome states, blamable states, inferior states, dark states, these are the ones that trouble the mind. So if we know the distinction be between the two, this is part of right view. Now, from a spiritual practice perspective, we overcome doubt when we follow the Buddha's instructions in the higher training. So we train in virtue, we train to concentrate the mind, we train in wisdom. When we do that, if we develop the virtue, and we remain secluded from sensual pleasures and unwholesome states, we attain to the higher concentration. So this is the easiest way of abandoning the five hindrances, all of them. So it's really good actually to develop a really solid practice, you know, fortified with the Buddha's teachings. That can be really helpful. It can be helpful towards studying, it can be helpful towards working, it can be helpful to all aspects of life. And of course, to the ultimate test at the point of death. So when we contemplate doubt, it's the same thing. We look at how does doubt arise? And it's usually because we're giving unwise attention to things that are the basis or the cause of doubt. So examples are, again, have I picked the right course? Will it give me the opportunities for work? What if there are jobs or a glut of graduates? What if this field of study isn't the right one? Um, the one about, Am I, will my parents accept my partner of a different race or religion? Will they still accept me if I go ahead? Will my partner be able to bear with the conditions? Things like that. Doubts about should I go for the promotion of work or will I even get an interview? So doubt really hinders the mind. Those are some examples. And then it's really quite unskillful. So one can contemplate the simile of traveling across the desert. One can also investigate the links to stinginess. But the most powerful thing is really developing the Noble Eightfold Path, being able to see the first Noble Truth of Suffering. And it's always easier when doubt is in the mind to start with the bigger predicament to see things as they really are. And doubt just simply tends to diminish or fall away when you give it the truth. 
it's it's really true. So if you like, we can do another meditation. Um, take your own example, apply some of the medicine, or even just contemplate for, for this, because I think doubt is a really uh, heavy one at times. And it can also be wrapped up with this whole spiritual part. So maybe just for a few minutes, let's just contemplate on doubt, maybe apply a bit of the medicine, but just really see whether you can penetrate the truth. Okay, let's do this for a few minutes. And then after that, we can take some questions. Okay, blessings of the triple gem.
And come out of the meditation. So we've now come to the end of the talk and the meditation. Let's express our gratitude to the Buddha for the wise teaching. Let's also express our gratitude to our other teachers, our parents and good friends who encourage us on the Noble Eightfold Path. We can also express gratitude in our mind to those who have helped to organize this session today, those who helped with the physical setup and the technology challenges. Much merit to you all, Anamodana. And we can share the merits of our Dhamma session today with all sentient beings. May all beings be happy and well. May all beings be free from suffering. Blessings of the Triple Gem to all of you who've attended today. Wishing you all well with your studies and your upcoming break. May you continue to find happiness in the Buddha's teachings, develop the Noble Eightfold Path, and grow in wholesome qualities. Wishing you all well. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We'll end the session here. Blessings of the Triple Jam.